Let's pray before we jump into the word today. Father, we thank you today for an opportunity to hear your word. Father, let your word become alive today, we pray in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you that there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for a friend. Father, we are grateful today for the love that we have in you. Father, we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. How many are ready to get into the word today? Are you ready? Come on, give the Lord a good hand clap of praise here today. We're going to conclude our series today talking about greater love. No greater love can you have than to lay down one's life for a friend. Found in John chapter 15. Now, here's what Jesus did. He he lived it out. It's exactly what Jesus has done for you and I. He gave his life so that you and I could have life everlasting, life abundantly. Today, I want to talk to you about how good God's love is. In fact, God loves imperfect people. How many imperfect people do we have in the building today? Just go ahead and be honest with yourself and raise your hand. Okay, two people didn't raise your hand and you're lying, so now you're imperfect. So now let's try it again. All the imperfect people, go ahead and lift a hand to have fantastic. I got the right message for the right crowd. He raised two hands. That's that's my boy there. He's 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 just being honest and real. Praise God. But anyway, today I want to remind us of how good God's love is. I don't know about you, but when I was raised up in my home of my mother and father, my dad raised. He was a pretty good, strong disciplinarian. He didn't let too many things slide. Now, he loved and he was gracious and, and uh, he was a really good father, always provided, um, always took care of his family and was faithful to his wife, faithful to his children and had a good dad and he's here today. And, and, uh, but he was a strong disciplinarian. And there were times whenever he would tell me something, give me instructions, and I would blow those instructions. And man, it was disappointing, and he disciplined me, but it wasn't so much the discipline that hurt, it was now he couldn't trust me next time. And man, I just didn't like that at all. I remember one time he gave us some instructions. I was about 16 years old, and at 16, you had a curfew. They may still have a curfew until you're about 17, but at 16, you had an 11 o'clock curfew. And we were out at a friend's and went to a birthday party and and all that, and we were having such a good time. And I, I called my dad and I said, Dad, I said, man, we, you know, we got to the party late and, and we're here, we're watching a movie, we're, ha- we're just having a good time. Can I come home at midnight instead of 11? He said, son, you know you have a curfew at 11. I said, I know, dad, but I said, I promise I'll be home at midnight, no problem. And it wasn't going to be a problem if that officer wouldn't have stopped me at about 11.47. And not only did I get a ticket for speeding on the thruway, because I was going to be, I wasn't going to make midnight. And then he looked at my license and says, oh, son, you're not 17. I'm now going to have to give you a ticket for out of curfew. And so I got home. It was really late. My dad's there said, son, I thought I said midnight. I said, well, if it wouldn't have been for officer so-and-so. I did not want to tell my dad that that night. And I handed him the ticket, and boy, was he upset. He said, I can't believe you got a ticket. I said, I didn't get one ticket. <laughs> I got two, the other for curfew. And what I, what I hated the most about it is there was never going to be a next time. The next time I'd be out past 11 o'clock, I'd be 36. Because I knew he couldn't trust me anymore. And, you know, it was based on my performance. Because my performance let him down. And I broke word and broke trust. I thought, he'll never trust me again. Most of the time, we we take that same type of relationship with our 
earthly father. For those of you that had a, a disciplinarian as an earthly father, we, we often take that into our spiritual relationship with Christ. And we feel the same way that, that unless I do really good, unless I stay between the lines, unless I get home by midnight and don't break curfew, as long as I make good decisions, as long as I make good grades, as long as I resist the temptation, as long as I'm treating everybody right, as long as I'm doing the best that I can, then God loves me. The problem with that logic is this. We all make mistakes. We, we all drop the ball. We all get that speeding ticket after curfew. And, and, and I don't care how good a person you are, and I don't care how, that you don't blow it that often, we're going to fail. We're going to let those that we love the most down. We, the ones that we care about the most, we're always not going to perform perfectly. And there are times when you know that you're to bite your tongue, but you just let it fly anyway. There are times when you said, this will be the last time that I ever do this, but you will do it again. We fail, we mess up, and it's easy to think, well, God doesn't trust me anymore. Well, God, I know God's mad at me now because, you know, I knew I shouldn't have done this. I really went too far. I really blew it. God won't have anything to do with me now. Recently, uh, someone asked me, said, Pastor Jay, would you take some time this week and pray for me? I've got a situation I'm walking through and I really could use some prayer. And people ask me that oftentimes and I, I oblige and I, I love to pray for others and believe and stand strong. The Bible says where two or three are gathered together. The Bible says that two or three together is a strand that's not easily broken. So I understand that. And, and, uh, and so I, I said, absolutely, I'd love to pray with you. And this is what they said. Well, Pastor Jay, thank you. Because the kind of life that I have lived, God would never want to hear my prayer. The kind of life that I have lived, God doesn't want or won't hear my prayer. And unfortunately, we often think that way. The truth is this, is when you fall, God doesn't turn away from you he comes running to you. And that's what we have to understand about the goodness of God. Well, it's too bad. Well, you had your chance. Well, I gave you the instructions. You came up short. No, he comes after you. Watch this. Someone said this. When you make a mistake, God doesn't love you the same. He loves you a little bit more. Some of you God loves you a whole, whole lot, right? There's a song that we sing that the mercy of God comes chasing after us. And that's exactly what we do. Yes, we ought to strive to be like Christ. Yes, we ought to be our best that we can, be our very best to others. It's good that we love others like Christ loved us and do good to those that hurt you even. And we do our best to, to be our best. But, but when you fail, don't beat yourself up because why? God loves imperfect people. I often think about that thought. I think about Peter. The apostle Peter hung with Jesus throughout Jesus' ministry here on earth. Jesus chose him to be one of his disciples. When Jesus chose Peter, he knew that Peter would one day deny him in the most critical hour of Jesus' life. But Jesus chose him anyway. Why? Because Jesus loves imperfect people. He knew that Peter was going to be imperfect. He knew that Peter would deny him. 
He knew that Peter would reject him. But God chose him anyway. You know what? God knows your past. He knows your present. He also knows your future. And he chooses you anyway. It's God's great love. The reason he chooses us is because God's love is not based on our performance. You see, oftentimes we, we think that we, it's easy to love others based on their performance. Yesterday, I went, had a wedding last night that I was officiating and, and I was working at the house and I came in and, and, and showered and got, was getting dressed and, and uh, went to put on uh, a shirt and forgot to pick up some clothes at the cleaners. I was like, uh-oh, I'm in a bind. It's not that I was just going to be in attendance. I was actually doing the ceremony. And I said, Tess, forgot to pick up the cle clothes at the cleaners. I said, I need a white shirt. And uh, she says, what are you going to do? I said, I have one. I just wore it the other day and I threw it in the dirty clothes basket where to go to the cleaners. And I said, and it's wrinkled bad. She says, oh, well, look, as long as you don't take your jacket off and you're wearing a tie, only a little, all I got to do is just clean up this little bit right here and the sleeves. I said, would you do? She goes, yes. So she stopped doing what she was doing and got out her iron and got out a little wash rag and some steam and she fixed me all up. Man, I look good right here. I mean, right here was perfect. And she stopped what she was doing, and she was also going to be in attendance at the wedding, so she's getting ready, and she, she stopped. You see, it's easy to love someone that's willing to stop everything they're doing to take care of you. It's easy to love someone that, that does good to you. It's easy to do good to a friend when they call you and they're in need. You don't mind going help because when you're in need, you call them and they come help. It's easy to reciprocate the love that you get from others around you. It's easy to love someone who loves you, and, 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 and it seems like it's perfect sense, and oftentimes we, we convert that into our relationship with God, and we feel that because we didn't do our part, that God loves us a little less, and he doesn't want to take our phone calls. But go back to that last slide, and it died. His love is not based on our performance, and I love that. It's based on our relationship. We are his children. As many times as I slipped up as a kid, as a teenager, my dad was stuck with me. He was stuck. I was a Miller boy, and I will forever be a Miller boy, and there was nothing he could do about it. We were family. He was my father. Nothing could ever change that. I was his child. He just had to keep believing, and my mom had to just keep praying. And man, did she pray. But it all worked out. Come on, somebody. So Jesus, uh, thank you for that one hand clap. I appreciate that. Jesus was about to be crucified. And he told Peter, he said, Peter, before they, the rooster crows three times, you will have, div you will have rejected me three times publicly. Peter said, there's no way, Jesus. I would never disown you. I, I would never reject you publicly. Never going to happen. Jesus, I'm your closest one. I'm one of the ones you chose first out of the rest of these guys. I'm the one that sits right next to you when we have dinner together. There's no way, Jesus, you got the wrong guy. They arrest Jesus. A lady pointed out to Peter. Peter said, no, I don't know Jesus. The second time, I don't know him. The third time, and right on cue, the rooster crowed. And when the rooster crowed, Peter and Jesus made eye contact. Imagine in that moment how Peter must have felt. When he just argued at the dinner table moments ago, a few hours ago, 
that it would not be him. And in the most critical hour of Jesus' life, Peter publicly denounced any relationship with Christ. You may have let your friend down. You may have let your spouse down. You may have let a coworker down. But I don't think any of us have let Jesus down publicly like that. And that's where Peter was. The Bible says that shortly after that, Jesus was arrested. Jesus was brought to the cross, crucified, and put in the grave. The Bible says that Peter went out and wept bitterly. He was brokenhearted. Jesus, hours later, died on the cross. Peter never had an opportunity to go to Jesus and say, Jesus, man, I blew it. Jesus, and I'm so sorry. I don't know what I was thinking. I don't, I don't, I don't know what came over me. Man, that was just such a bad decision. Jesus, I, I'm sorry. I ask that you forgive me. Peter never had the opportunity to make it right with Jesus. It broke his heart. Now, I'm sure Peter was thinking, now, great. Now, I've, my destiny is ruined. My, my future is ruined. It'll, it'll never be the same. And surely God is done with me now. And oftentimes we disqualify ourselves. Well, you know what? I, I know that I've broken some rules and I, I know that I've let God down. And, you know, I, I, you know I, I, I got pregnant early and that was a bad choice and a bad decision. I know that God is probably done with me. I, I was unfaithful in my marriage vows with my spouse. And I, I know that God must, must be really disappointed in me. And I've made all of these bad decisions. And, and I have these addictions. I keep saying that I'm never going to do it again. But I can't ever break away away from these addictions. I can't break away from these habits. And I, I surely God is done with me. It's where Peter was. Peter broken heart and thought, God, you're done with me. I, I made too many mistakes. And, but I want to remind you that God's not done. God loves imperfect people. In fact, the more you mess up, the more he loves you. When you make a mistake, God doesn't turn from you. He turns toward you. We got to remember that in our relationship with Christ. He doesn't love you less. He loves you more and he keeps coming after you. Friday, he was crucified. On Sunday, Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb. She's going to bring some spices and some, some oils for the tomb, for the body of Jesus. And when she gets to the tomb, if you remember, the stone had been rolled away. And there's an angel sitting on top of the stone and on top of the tomb. The angel appeared and said to Mary, who are you? She didn't recognize him as an angel at the moment. She says, who are you here to see? She says, I'm here to see and anoint the body of Jesus. And the angel says to her, he is not here. He is risen. Now I want you to go and I want you to tell the disciples. Now the, all the disciples that could have been named, they were all together. He says, I want you to go tell all the disciples and tell Peter. You remember the one that just rejected him publicly just moments ago. We pick up the story in Mark's gospel. When the Sabbath was over, Mary, the mother of James, and brought spices so that they may go and anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. Got to go fast. And they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? Verse 4. But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter. Now that 
word may not mean anything to anybody, but I guarantee it meant something to Peter. And that that word may not mean anything to anybody, but if you know the, the back story, that was huge. And, and, and it could be, just go ahead and replace the word Peter with your name. Sometimes we feel that God must be mad, that God must totally be upset, that God must be totally done with me because I, I, I said I wouldn't, but I did. And I said I did, but I didn't. And, and, and Jesus says, now go tell all the people, but tell Jay, go tell all the people but and, and tell Tessie and specifically point somebody out. He's going ahead of you in the gallery there. You will see him just as he told you. The Lord was really saying, Peter, I know you think I'm disappointed in you. I know that you think that I can no longer use you, but that's not who I am. I'm not a God based on your performance I'm a God that's based on my performance. I'm a God that's based on what I've done, not what you could or should do or will do. And, 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 and of all the people that he could have specifically pointed out, he pointed out Peter. And he's saying, I, I'm the God of a second chance. I'm a God of another chance because some of you pass your second chance. When you fall, I'm going to run after you. I'm gonna, you may be full of guilt, Peter, but you know what? You can move forward. The Bible says that Mary ran and found the disciples. When she found the disciples, she said, y'all, Jesus is alive. The angel of the Lord met me. Jesus is alive. Oh, and Peter, he called you out by name. Now, can you imagine, can you imagine what Peter was thinking I don't know, the Bible doesn't record this, but I can imagine he stopped and said, Mary, he said what? Did he really call my name? Yes, he said to tell the disciples and Peter. Something ignited on the inside of the apostle Peter. He began to shake off the guilt, the self-pity, the condemnation. And like you, you may have blown it in your past. You may have made some mistakes that you thought, surely this is it. But I want to remind you that God still says, I'm going to still get you to where I need you to be. And I'm still committed in you moving forward with your life. Something went off on the inside. Peter began to realize that Jesus had forgiven him. Peter began to realize that, that Jesus still loved him, that Jesus still had a call, that Jesus still had a purpose, that Jesus still had a plan for his life. The Bible says that not long after that, in Acts chapter 2, you begin to read that Peter went out knowing that he was forgiven. Peter began to preach the word of God and you know what? Bible says that one day Peter preached and 3,000 people made a decision to follow Christ. It's the number one recorded conversion at one message in the entire Bible. No other testimony of conversion has more than 3,000 converts and Peter preached that message after he realized he was forgiven. It would have never happened if Peter didn't understand this principle that God loves imperfect people. Many today, they're sitting on the sideline of life, never really fully engaging. Someone join me on keys. Never fully engaging because they feel that God has to be disappointed in them. That I had a great purpose, but because of my imperfection, now God's purpose is either diluted or it's way down. I can't really hope for anything great. What if Peter would have felt that way? He said, well, I know you forgive me, God, but I guess I'll just never do anything great. No, he understood 
that God loves imperfect people and that God is not disappointed in you and there's nothing you could ever do that is a surprise to God. You got to shake off the guilt and realize that God is running after you. He doesn't love you less. He actually loves you more. How many grateful for the love of Jesus Christ today? With every head bowed and eye closed, if you're here today and you recognize and realize that, that you've blown it, made mistakes, I want to remind you today that you're the kind of person that Christ is looking at. If Christ was looking for perfect people, then he wouldn't need uh, any of us here today because we've all blown it, we've all missed it, and we've all come short. The Bible says in Romans that all have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. And with that understanding, we know that God loves imperfect people. Today, as I was praying this morning, there's some of you today that just need to shake off the guilt. The enemy has been hanging that over your head long enough. Every time you feel like you've taken one step forward, the enemy reminds you of your past and you take two steps back. And today's the day you stop retreating. Today's the day you stop and say, no, God's plan is still in place and my best days are ahead because God loves imperfect people. God doesn't run from imperfect people. He runs to imperfect people. A lifeguard is not stationed at a swimming pool to look out for those that can swim. A lifeguard is stationed where he is for those that can't or those that get in a bind. That's why they're stationed where they are. God, in the same way, His love is stationed not for the perfect, but for the imperfect so that He can make a move when we fail. I'm grateful today that God doesn't give up on me. And I'm telling you, God hasn't given up on you. Shake off the guilt. Shake off the shame. And just defy the odds. And just shake it back at the devil and say, Devil, you have no hold on me. I'm free. I'm forgiven. I'm not under condemnation. I am free to perform. I am free to move forward in the things of God. And you know what? You have no hold on me any longer. I'm going to do all that God has called me to do. Would you shake that guilt off right now? Come on, right now, in this, in the, if that's you today, and you're just believing that, that you're, you're done with this, this self-pity, you're done with this guilt, this shame, I want to pray for you right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, just extend a hand to me. And Father, in the name of Jesus, I stand with all of those today. Father, there, I thank you that there is no shame, there is no guilt, there is no condemnation. Father, you are running to us today. Father, I thank you that you're breaking that spirit that shackles us down, that changes us, that binds us. And Father, I thank you that we are released to go do what you called us to do. Father, I thank you for that in the precious name of Jesus. And Father, we are honored to serve you, to love you, to worship you because you love imperfect people. And that's exactly who we are. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Come on, put your hands together today.